Thanks very much. Um, it's really nice to be here. It's actually my first time in uh, Helsinki. Uh, we had a great dinner last night. I really enjoyed um, meeting quite a few of the games companies here. And I was really um, positively surprised by how much everyone is sharing, how friendly the atmosphere is here in, in Helsinki. And um, no, we had, a, we had a great time. It was, it was really good. What I want to do is um, tell you a little bit about natural motion, where we've come from, um, what we're doing right now, where we think we're going, um, kind of our journey a little bit, but also what we find important um, in the games industry, um, why we make the games that we make and how we go about it. So the background to all of this is that we are actually not originally a games company. We started out uh, quite a few years ago, actually, 13 years ago, um, in Oxford to commercialize research on the motion of uh, animals and of humans. So that's how we um, initially got interested into games because we felt that actually if we can simulate things um, on screen rather than using animation, we can create um, fully interactive characters. And that was our original dream. Uh, and it started with something like this that you can see here. So here's a very simple bipedal creature that tries to learn how to walk over time. <laughs> Uh, it's not particularly good at the beginning, as you can see. But after a few more generations of um, learning, you'll see that it takes the first steps. And the way this works, actually, is it uses artificial evolution, a genetic algorithm uh, that allows this um, creature to learn itself how to perform a task. It uses a neural network um, that drives muscles in a <coughs> physically simulated body. And you know, it was still quite simple around then, but we were super excited because we thought, wow, if we can use this in games, and hopefully scale it up to a full human body that looks really realistic and it all runs in real time, then we have something amazing. Because then we can liberate games from the shackles of animation in many ways. Um, all of a sudden, what you see on the screen actually happens in real time and is completely interactive. Um, that turned out to be incredibly hard. Um, we were very naive. Uh, I was, in particular, very naive about how hard this actually was going to be. Because um, not only, quite frankly, does this not look like a human, um, it also doesn't have any arms, um, but also this was running just about on a PC fast enough, whereas we wanted to run all of this back then on the PlayStation 2 and the, um, the Xbox, and they simply weren't fast enough. Um, so we had to first make all of this work for human characters and then uh, commercialize this in movies, and it was used in movies like, like uh, Troy, for example, Lord of the Rings, Spider-Man, and, and many others um, to create virtual stuntmen. But the dream was always to use it in real time, as I was saying, and I want to kind of quickly show you why we got so excited by this. Here's a, here's two very simple Euphoria characters, and this is actually a video that we grabbed um, during a meeting. So we had a Euphoria product meeting. This was some time ago, and we were chatting about the product, and someone had left two characters a little bit too close um, on the screen together. And this was just happening whilst we were chatting. And we noticed that they were starting to squabble. <laughs> they were clearly not happy with being in the same space at the same time and tried to push the other one away. And this actually went on for another 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and it showed us something that we hadn't really seen before on the screen, and that is emergence. Stuff happens that you didn't put in, but because you put in the systems and you simulate the underlying systems, all of a sudden you have something that you didn't expect. And that's where we think the, the magic is of, of doing these things and of doing something different, and that hopefully will come through um, throughout the talk. We try to do things that are really hard and um, that are really different, because we think if we can pull them off, then we have a step change. And that's what we're trying to do across all of our games as well. And uh, anyway, so here are these guys go, and like I said, this keeps, keeps going on for a while. We were super lucky in that um, uh, Rockstar approached us a few years back, wanted to use our technology in real time. Uh, at that point, we didn't have an engine that was running fast enough. Uh, we eventually had one, and we called it Euphoria, and it ended up in Breath of the Auto 4, in uh, Red Dead Redemption, in Max Payne 3, and also the most recent uh, GTA 5. So if you play those games, uh, the character interactions, um, whether you shoot or whether you interact with the bonnet of a car with a, with a, a character, uh, that's all driven by our Euphoria engine. And, uh, Back then was already um, a time where I think risk and, and taking risks and you know trying to persevere through them uh, was really obvious. We actually had an engine that wasn't remotely fast enough to run uh, in a game, let alone a game as big as GTA 4. And we eventually had to make it run about 10 times faster than it originally was and already optimized. Um, and we managed to get it to work. And that is kind of what showed us that if you take risks, 
if you try and do something hard and you really, really push, you can make it happen. And then something else happened, and that is um, the uh, iPhone came along, and the iPhone changed everything for us. Because we felt that with the iPhone, all of a sudden, everyone had a device on themselves that was fast enough to run magical technology that would create amazing experiences. And we felt that was a, a, a huge opportunity. So we actually started making games ourselves. And the reason we got excited about this is because we knew from um, console games that there was a huge evolution of, of richness of games, starting with Pong in the early 70s to then you know, going to Gran Turismo 5 and obviously Call of Duty and other games that just look amazing. And we felt that was a pretty clear evolution for hardcore gamers. But we also thought that actually it's not just hardcore gamers who like this kind of richness and believable characters. There was quite a lot of evidence that the general audience, the mass market, likes um, richness too. And you only look, have to look at animated movies to see proof of that, starting in the 30s with Snow White um, and then going to via Toy Story to films like uh, Monsters Inc. And, and Finding Nemo and obviously um, Toy Story 3 and other amazing looking movies. And the big change happened here in the mid-90s when we went from Lion King, <coughs> kind of the last big two, uh, to do 2D game, to, uh, sorry, movie to Toy Story, which was the first big 3D one. And actually, movies never went back to 2D. Um, and to kind of, I guess, less richer experiences. Um, I think mobile gaming is somewhat different. I think you know, a lot of different genres can do that at the same time. But there was really clear evidence that people liked richness. People want to be wow. They want to see something that they haven't seen before. And that's really what we built the company and our, our, games, uh, our games business on. So the first games we did um, all tried to achieve this, like try and achieve something that looks amazing and make it really accessible. And uh, the first games that we did were all um, actually paid games, um, which was still all the rage at the time, uh, pretty much throughout 2010 and 2011. And um, they worked well. Um, they, the average return on investment was about five times, uh, probably before those games. But we felt that there was an even bigger opportunity. We felt that if we can create something that looks amazing and we make it free, then it can go much, much bigger. And this is the time where we kind of started to scale the company. We started to get a bit more confidence that this approach was working. and. We released a game called My Horse, and My Horse was a complete departure for us because, um, as you can tell, it's about horses, um, and it's trying to create something that is, you know, takes the genre seriously. We tried to create a horse on your device that looked amazingly realistic, um, using our animation technology to drive, you know, really realistic animation. And let's see if that's still working. This is a big presentation, about one gigabyte. And, uh, and be able to stroke it. Actually, in real life, this looks much more realistic than it does right now. Right? <laughs> so I, would, I would encourage you to download this onto your iPad. Because what you can do um, in the game is actually pet the horse and it reacts to you, etc. And what we try to do is, I want to stop this now because it looks ridiculous. Um, what we try to do is um, really give you the feeling that the horse is real. However stupid that sounds, we felt that if you believe the horse is real, then you will love the game. And that is what we're trying to achieve. We want you to build up an emotional connection with the game through the richness of the experience. And this game became by far our most important game uh, up to that point and our most um, successful game. There were way more downloads, obviously, than anything else, but also did more revenues than any of the, in fact, all of the um, other paid games taken together. Um, so we were super proud of that, and it was also a bit of a kind of fuck you to the market. We're going to do a horse game. What are you going to do? <laughs> we, just, we just felt. We just wanted to do something different, and, and that's something that we're doing with all of our other games too. It's like we want to do something different. Um, but we also made a lot of mistakes in this game, and if, if you play it, and if you look at it from a free-to-play um, point of view, you'll see that we didn't really nail the game loop the way we should have. Um, we didn't really nail uh, monetization the way we should have. Um, and as a result, we felt actually there's got to be, there's got to be a better way to make a free-to-play game and for us to learn from this and create something more successful. So we uh, went into car racing. Uh, we are really um, passionate about cars. Um, I love cars. And we wanted to create something that would fit um, the mobile play pattern, but also uh, look gorgeous. So that, um, here we go. that game became CSR Racing, and that, um, to that point, became our most successful game. And what we tried to do in this game was, we love games like Real Racing, for example, um, but we felt that they were too hard to play in, in short bursts, but at the same time, we wanted to convey the richness of the cast. So we, we went for drag racing, and the guys from Creative Mobile obviously are here who know a lot about drag racing too, and as a, 
as a pattern, as a gameplay pattern, and it works incredibly well because it's a much shorter game loop, it's about 15 seconds, um, you get reward very quickly, and you can create something that hopefully feels great, but also is very short to play. So you can see here a screenshot um, from the game, and if you haven't downloaded it, I'd, I'd encourage you to do it. Um, and we were blown away um, by how the game uh, performed. It actually became the number one top grossing game uh, when it came out, uh, stayed number one top grossing for a long time. Uh, it grossed over $12 million in the, in the, first, uh, in the first month alone, and is still a very strong revenue generator for us now. And this game transformed the company um, in many ways because A, it gave us a lot of money that we could now use to build a company, um, but B, it also gave us a lot of confidence that the approach that we were trying to take, which is to create these kind of rich experiences, was actually working. And that was the time when we started to really think about how are we going to scale the company and what is the opportunity right now that we have. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit because there are very few times, I think, in, in history um, where you can build a really transformative entertainment company. Um, this only really happens when the market is entirely disrupted or when a new medium is invented. And arguably that's what's happening right now with mobile gaming. And that's why we're all here. We're all trying to learn stuff and we're all trying to see how can we deal with user acquisition and uh, you know, how can we create games that are social and that people love. But that's because the opportunity is so big. And we think that if you are really smart and you if you think about scaling smartly, you can create an amazing company. And the things that we've learned is uh, uh, there are several, but one of them is you should party when you have a success. So we actually, when CSR Racing came out uh, and the revenues were going out, we had cake and champagne every day. Uh, it was getting ridiculous. <laughs> we were doing it for over a week where we just, <laughs> just getting ridiculous. And you know, we had many, many happy times. It was just an amazing, uh, amazing time. But really one of the biggest um, lessons that we learned was it, it really pays to invest in your product. And I can't overstate how important that is. The product is everything. Everything else is peripheral. You have to focus on the product and create something that people really want to play and people really love. And that means not cutting corners, that means iterating over and over and over again until it's so painful you think you're going crazy, and then some more. And that's what we did with CSR Racing. We, um, we actually finished the game quite quickly, uh, within about five months, um, and we then spent about four months just polishing it. I just want to give you a few examples here from these screenshots. Um, so we licensed a whole range of car manufacturers. We went to all of them. I went to Audi and sat down with the Audi licensing guy, and I showed him uh, my horse and said, imagine this as a car, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it worked. It worked. They, um, they, they bought it, uh, luckily, and we managed to license a whole range of car companies for launch and a lot more since. But we also were really presenting about the car. So you see the Audi R8 here, and if you look at the way we render it, um, the shaders that we use, the colors that we use, the officially approved Audi colors, um, the environment, the cameras, we obsessed about everything. We, because we wanted you to feel like this car was a little bit your car. Like if you bought an Audi R8 and CSR Racing, and you saw it, it felt like 5% of the feeling of actually owning a real R8. That's what we try to do with this. And, uh, and I think that worked. And a lot of people um, kind of, I think, think that CSR racing is about racing. We don't think so. We think CSR racing is about your love for cars and car ownership. That's really important for us. And the racing part is obviously also important, but it's about the cars more than anything else. Another thing that we spend so much time on is this screen here. It's the, uh, it's the results screen. So when you play the game and you, you win or you lose, um, you see kind of the, your rewards. And they come in. Uh, from the right, they build up, um, and we wanted to make sure this feels really special. It needed to be something that every time you played it, it felt a little bit like a fairy dust. It felt <laughs> super good. So we spent, I think, several weeks just on the screen. Um, Barclay, who's our VP of games, knows this. We spent so much time on this. It was, it was pretty crazy. Um, and Barclay's in the audience over there at the back. Um, but it paid off, because now every time you played and you finished and you topped and tailed the game in a way that it just felt good. And that is a huge part of the addictiveness addictiveness of the game. And then finally, one other example, um, the icon. We obsessed about this as well. It looks like a pretty simple icon, but this is version 95 of different <laughs> icons. And uh, the other ones were just small variations. They were completely different icons. Uh, we tested all of them. By the way, we do online testing, like a lot of people now do as well. So we check um, you know, what the click-through rate is for different types of icons. But I would encourage everyone to 
try something else if you want to see whether your icon works. And that is to put your icons on a screenshot and stick them, stick them on your iPhone and you have it like this. And then to glance away and then glance back at your iPhone briefly and see whether your eye gets attracted by your icon. Because that's really how most people think about which game to play next once they've downloaded it. They, they swipe to their phone and they, their eye needs to almost at a retina level arrive at a particular icon. That, I think, is actually an even better test than, uh, than doing those big analytics campaigns uh, for, uh, for icons. That's how we arrived at that, and um, that ended up working really well. The two stripes were a late addition, which we think made, made a huge difference. So investing in the product is super important. Because there's one more thing, and that is, if you invest in the product, then people will talk about the product. And we talked about this earlier, and you see gave a great presentation about how people find out about the product. You want people to show their friends. Uh, you always want to have this analog plurality, and you can design games in a way where you can make it really easy. So if you look at my horse, you start it up, you see the horse. If you look at CSR Racing, you start it up, you see the car. You don't see a menu schema, sc screen or anything else, you see the car. And we're doing that because we want people to say to their friends, check this game out. They start it up and they can show their car. That's super powerful. It's very hard to measure, but it's super powerful. And we just always try and imagine people in the pub sharing their games, talking about their games, and that's how we design them so they can show it off. The other thing that we find really important as a company is to find blue oceans. And what I mean by that is, is to make games that other people don't make. We don't think there is much point in making games that are just variants of existing games. And uh, the reason for that is that th there's, there's one like, very pragmatic reason, and that is um, you want to make sure that uh, you're not competing uh, for the same audience. Um, but there's another reason as well, and that is life's, life's too short for, we think, just copying other people's games. There are so many opportunities out there that it pays to do something really special um, and then to look back at it and be really proud of it. But to come back to the, to the actually pragmatic reason, um, the, the problem you have <coughs> is to create a game that um, essentially is in a red ocean, so there's already a super competitive genre, is you fall into a user acquisition treadmill. You end up essentially competing for the same audience with several other companies that have also created this kind of game or cloned that kind of game. And the problem with that is, sure, you can optimize your game and increase your monetization and make sure that your LTV goes up and up and up, but everyone else is doing that. You're on a hamster wheel um, that only the advertising companies profit from. We essentially deal with a small margin that kind of goes, stays exactly the same as your overall monetization um, goes up. And that is not a way to create long-term enterprise value. You have to be able to control your margins. You have to be able to make a profit, and ideally an increasing profit, out of your game. And the only way you do that is to create content that's so differentiated from other people that you're not competing for the same audience. That to us is super important, and um, as a strategy, falls back again, it boils down to the product. It needs to be a great product, and it needs to be differentiated, so you don't have to play that everyone else is playing. As soon as you play the game that everyone else is playing, you will eventually have too small a margin to make great games. This is already happening in the industry right now. Related to this is that we think it's important to take risks. And um, by that I mean, sometimes you want to bite off a little bit more than you can chew. Because that's the only way to create true innovation. That's the only way to create a true breakout product and something that's completely different. And I want to give an example of that, and that is um, a game called Comes a Ninja, which we um, released just over a week ago, and uh, we worked on actually f also for quite some time. It was great, great to uh, hear Ari uh, talking about how much time they're spending on the game. We also spent a lot of time on Comes a Ninja. We actually showed it um, at the uh, iPhone keynote, iPhone 5 keynote last year, um, mm -hmm. and we were hoping to get the game done actually shortly after uh, for the holiday season, but it took quite a lot longer because it only recently came out. And the reason it took a lot longer is because this was a really, really hard game to make because what we were trying to do was create a recognizable character that people loved instantly, but at the same time make him completely interactive. So the entire character was supposed to be based on a simulation-based system, our Euphoria system. So we would do away with, our, uh, with animation that would usually drive things like when you poke him, when you pick him up, and just make everything simulated because we believe that if we can do that, it will feel transformatively different. The audience wouldn't think this is great technology, but the audience would think this is real, and they'd have an element of surprise and humor. That was the idea, but that was incredibly difficult because we needed to get the technology to work, and it was all running on our own animation technology, but also on our own graphics engine. 
Now on top of that, it is a game where you interact with your character, and I actually can show you a little bit what it looks like. Um, and you can download it from the App Store now as well. But we also need to create a game around it. So it's not enough to just have a character that you can interact with and hopefully that you like. You needed to create something <laughs> that you really felt um, you could have a journey with. And that ended up being really hard to do. And you see here some of the interactions that you can do with a character. He's quite cute, and as you can see, he's, um, he is fully interactive. He has his own mind, and we, we all now in the company know what kind of character he is. We know what he likes, what he doesn't like. Um, we, we wanted him to have a heart of gold. You can do whatever you want with him, but he still likes you, and he still comes back to you, and he still knocks on the, on the camera. Um, this, this particular thing, for example, our punch bag, um, it might look pretty straightforward. It was so hard for us to do, to make all of this work, a fully physically simulated punch bag that needed to be hit by AI in a way that we could control, turns out to be non-trivial. And this was just one of many games. Here's another one, uh, which is the trampoline. So the ninja is really shy at the beginning of the trampoline, but he gets better and better. And you can see here that even thing after a while, he even has a few special moves that he does. <laughs> so this is the demo that we showed a while ago. And you can see the, the, the technology already worked when we showed it um, uh, at the Apple event. But there was just much, much more to do with this game. And we battled through a lot of battles, in particular on the design front, because it was really hard to figure out what would be fun and what isn't fun. But we wanted to do it because we felt that if it is fun, it would be different to anything else that people have seen. And we, like I said, released the game just over a week ago, and it's now the number one game. It's breaking all of our expectations. It's done way more downloads than we've ever done and it's monetizing much better um, than we ever expected to, which is a big relief and it's, it's a really great feeling for the company to, to have come through this. And hopefully now we've created a character IP that, that we can in, uh, enrich in the future, we can expand on in the future, and we can do lots of different things and you know, there even the possibility to create a franchise out of it. And that's really the next thing I wanted to talk about is if you fight blue oceans, you create a great product and you take a risk that is um, you know, resulting in something that's truly different, you have the ability to create franchises. You can create new IP that can last for a long time. And that's the other, I think, big prize in, in, uh, in gaming. Now is the time to create new brands, IPs, and franchises. And, and we're trying this out with CSR Racing. CSR Racing came out uh, just over a year and a half ago, and we recently uh, released a variant of it in the, in the family called CSR Classics, which is all about, again, drag racing, but it's about classic cars. Uh, and this time, restoring them, making them look amazing, and racing them against other classic cars. Uh, we launched this game about, I think, a, a month and a half ago, and it again, uh, it went into the top 10, top grossing. We're super happy with the way that worked, and, and hopefully that's something that we can now continue, we can expand on, and we can learn from, because, again, this is a big opportunity in the industry right now, is to create lasting brands. The other thing that we think is really important, and it's in our DNA, is technology. And it's not technology for technology's sake, it's technology to create something magical on screen that people haven't seen before. And you know, I've got a bit of a boring picture of servers here. Um, servers are very important to us because analytics are very important. We are running our own analytics system and just as an example of how much of a difference this can make, we, um, we uh, launched Comes a Ninja in uh, Singapore and New Zealand um, as a soft launch for about two months and our analytics team managed to increase the monetization in the game by a factor of five um, just through A-B testing and just through sticking with it and rebalancing the game. So super powerful um, if you have a system that can do that and you have a team that can do that. But I also already mentioned um, Euphoria, it's our own engine. We still license our technology to other companies, in particular onto uh, Xbox One now and uh, PlayStation 4. And Paul sits over there, um, he actually, actually licenses that technology to console developers. It's still an important part of our DNA. We believe that if you make technology that you can sell to other people, uh, then you have a DNA of packaging something in a way that your own teams can use it well too. And that's something that, that we've been doing and it's working out really well for us because then you have technology that can be deployed easily across your games. But probably one of the most important things in all of this is to invest in communication in a company. And this is something that we are, we are learning right now because the company has grown quite fast um, to now about 270 people. We've got studios in Oxford, which is where our headquarters are. We've got two studios in uh, London, one in Brighton and one in San Francisco. And when you grow that fast, you have to make sure that people talk to each other and that whatever you've learned, you can apply. 
So for example, if you look at um, CSR racing, there are lots of things that we learned from CSR racing, but we figured out that it was actually really hard to get the knowledge across to everyone in the company. So what we started doing was these events here. You see a couple of examples. We call them product offsites, where we get all the product leads, product managers, designers, analysts, etc., together to uh, come together in a, in a in a college in Oxford, and we spend a whole day on a particular topic. And that topic may be uh, live teams, it may be um, virality, or it may be um, a guilt um, guilt versus guilt gameplay. And we do that because it's almost our mini conference where we can be super honest about stuff. We can tell people what we don't know, what we'd like to know. We can get people's input. Uh, we have people give talks, and then we have discussion groups and workshops. And it's super valuable and also super fun. Um, we're learning so much now from each other, and we've learned so much from CSR Racing that we applied to Kamsi Ninja, um, that this is giving us real confidence that it's really important. Other things that we do is every Monday we get everyone together via um, conference calls um, uh, in, uh, at five o'clock uh, in Oxford and get everyone in by, uh, by conference systems and we talk about our games. Everyone has to show their game, everyone has to show what their latest progress is, whatever it looks like. Um, it goes up on a big wall, a, a big presentation, they show the latest screenshots, things that they've struggled with, things that they're working on, things that they're proud of and what that has done is it manage to make people understand what other people are doing. It makes them feel, uh, feel uh, part of an overall team. And that kind of structure is really hard to achieve and that kind of feeling in a bigger company. We're really working hard on that right now and I think, I think it's working hopefully quite well. So that's kind of our overall impressions right now of the things that we think are important to create a, a company that hopefully becomes a, a big entertainment company. And there are lots of other things here that we found are really important um, and we're still learning lots and lots of stuff. But probably the most important thing for us that we've learned is that it's important to be proud of what you're creating because that's really what this is all about. It's not necessarily just about building a business and um, ha having processes in place and everything else. It's about creating a product that when you are 70 or 80 years old, you can look back on and you think, I'm so proud of what we've done. And that is the overriding thing for everything that we're doing here and that's what we're here for. So thanks very much. Are there any questions? Hello, nice presentation, thank you very much. Uh, you talked about the analytics company and you follow it so clearly. So what was the name of the company? Uh, we actually use our own analytics ah, okay. system, yeah. Um, so we, we've been working with third-party analytics systems too, and we still use it to some extent, but we are we're shifting towards our own system. And the main reason, it's an interesting one, because we, we in general like licensing technology, and we license a lot of technology in, and we also sell technology, obviously. But in this particular case, we, there were some things that we needed to do, in particular large-scale <coughs> user segmentation, that we weren't able to get from third parties at, at that particular point in time. This was a few months ago. So we built our own systems, even though I was quite against it, I have to say, initially, because I was concerned about the overhead. And um, it did two things. A, we were able to answer the questions that we wanted, which was great. Mm -hmm. But two, and that was quite unexpected, it galvanized the analytics team. They started to want to show off what they could find out and what recommendations they could give to the, back then, the CSR racing team. And that was really, really helpful. It, it transformed our analytics uh, approach in general. Okay, another question about the Ninja game. So. Are uh, players teasing the characters very much? <laughs> Say that again. Are uh, players teasing the characters? Oh, I see. Um, <laughs> teasing or torturing, depends on how you call it. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, and it's actually, um, it's funny because, so we user tested this game, and I was actually gonna mention this earlier. We user tested Comes Ninja like we had user tested no other game before. We, um, we did probably for three months, um, about three user tests of six people every single week. Um, it was super painful because if you see people play a game and uh, they don't get it, which was the case at the beginning, and they didn't know what to do, um, it's really painful, but you have to do it to improve your game. But what we also found out there was that there were two types of play patterns. One was the caring one, and the other one was the torturing one. And uh, it, it, there was quite a lot, I mean, a lot of people took a lot of pressure just throwing the ninja around, and in many ways it said more about them than, than about the game, but it was a, <laughs> It, it, it was good to see um, because we caught it earlier and we don't mind people teasing the ninja and throwing him around but what we did mind was when it was becoming too violent because people are quite inventive 
And uh, what we ended up doing, if you play with the game, I could almost demo to you here, is if you pull the ninja up and you pull him up by one leg, for example, and his head is down, when you let him drop, we will always make sure that he doesn't fall on his head, for example, because it just looks like you could be breaking his neck. We didn't want to uh, <laughs> uh, show that. So we have those little tricks in there um, because you know it's part of the game plan. Well, at the moment we're focusing on iOS, and um, we we really like iOS as a platform. We feel that we understand the user. Um, we, we, you know, I'm a I'm a uh, Apple user myself. We feel the user a little bit better, and um, we feel that this this game really fits iOS. How's that for the response? Congratulations on the content. I think my three and a half year old was was laughing. One hour straight. <laughs> 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 it was really nice to see. So what was the project size like in nine months? I, I can't say it in nine months because I don't know, but um, it was. So we had at the peak 19 people on it. 19. 19, yeah. Okay. Quite a big team. And uh, I mean, it took us. When we, when we um, showed the game publicly in September, we only really had a tech demo. Um, and that's kind of the video I showed earlier. We then spent the next you know, roughly 12 months m making the full game out of it and going sometimes in a few wrong directions, having to revert back and then hopefully eventually going in the right direction. And um, that's where probably most of the time actually was spent is, is, is iterating and getting rid of stuff and making it elegant, more and more elegant and honing in on what the game is about. Any more questions? This one over there. Um, that's a good question, Barclay. Do you know, know the answer to that? Uh, not exactly. No. So, um, yeah, it will have been throughout the CSR yeah. racing. I think when the game came out and we realized there's huge amounts of data and uh, we needed to deal with it, both just analyzing it but also collecting the data and having the technology to do it. I think it was around that time. That's probably about right, Barclay, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but we also transitioned from having more people on a team and as central team to support that. So it was kind of a, a bit of an evolution. Yeah, and just for reference, for example, I mean, just to sh see how much heavy lifting there needs to be, Clumsy Ninja at the moment, we're collecting 1.2 terabytes of analytics data every day at the moment. It's uh, quite a lot. <coughs> As it turns out, not that easy to handle. If I can have, I can have an add-on question. Um, does most analytics companies get, uh, do they give you the raw data so you can no, so so we, we use our, it's all our own that we're using. Buckley, you can again probably explain it better. Do you yeah, want to? so most of the third parties that we use, we weren't, we weren't able to get hold of the data after it's gone through, and a lot of them also wouldn't allow segmentation questions after the event. They could only ever look at new users entering the funnel. Um, that isn't the case for all, but we found that the, um, all the different permutations didn't have the perfect sort of recipe or grouping of things that we wanted to do. So we ended up with three or four running at the same time, which wasn't like all of That's what pushed us to sort of unify that. Yeah. Any other questions? No? In which case, thank you very much.